Well, good morning and hello once again. It's my privilege to begin to open the Word of God with you. Uh, this is the Sunday that is celebrated as Palm Sunday. And we have been in this whole series about the life and ministry of Jesus. And it really centers around this moment uh, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And you're going to see this whole uh, ministry that he's been having really kind of be condensed as we begin to move through this week we call Holy Week. And, and so all the events are kind of bunched closer together. We're going to see a significant ramping up of ministry activities. We're also going to see a pretty exponential ex escalation of Jesus' interaction specifically with the religious leaders. And so uh, this is a really pivotal moment that uh, obviously moves us toward next Sunday, which culminates in the resurrection and our celebration of that. Uh, but I am really uh, thrilled to be able to open up the Word of God with you. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to take them and keep them open in front of you. We're actually going to be working through several different passages in chapter 11 here of Mark. And let's open our Bibles and, and begin to work through uh, this message, which I've called Arriving in Jerusalem. So let's open the Word of God together as we begin in the section, which is essentially known as the triumphal entry. And that's Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And this is what it says. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And then they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem went into the temple, and when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So this is the first moment that's recorded for us here, and we see that Mark points out a very uh, few interesting things here as we begin. We see these prominent themes starting to come to the forefront of Jesus as a king, of Jesus who saves, that's what Hosanna really means, it means Lord save or save us. And then we see this aspect of Jesus as a promised Messiah. And you're like, well, where are you getting that out of that passage, Pastor Doug? Well, let me explain a little bit of what's going on here. So first of all, Jesus has already been making his way toward Jerusalem. I've been alluding to that several times in the messages leading up to this. And we know John records for us in his gospel that there had been a moment where Jesus stopped over with and raised Lazarus from the dead. We know that that happens. He stops back in through Bethany. He's making his way to Jerusalem. There's a whole group of people that were already kind of crowding around Jesus because they had seen him and been part of this miraculous event. And as they draw near to Jerusalem, we know that that crowd continues to grow. There's a lot of buzz going on as Jesus continues to get closer to the city. Well, as he nears the city, he says to his disciples, I want you to go in and untie this colt and bring it to me. Now that seems a very strange request, but there's a little bit of information that Mark doesn't give to us. But if you have your Bibles and you want to turn real quickly over to Matthew, Matthew is going to give us a little more context as to why Jesus is going to ride on this donkey and also why the crowd responds the way they do. And this is what it says in Matthew chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, came to Bethpage, the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go in the village in front of you, and immediately you'll find a colt, or a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. 
This took place, notice what Matthew says, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Now the prophet he's referencing is Zechariah. And we see in, in chapter 9, verse 9, this is what the prophet Zechariah says. Say to the daughter of Zion, Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. And so these people who are also crowding around Jesus, many of them obviously are very likely Jews and even potentially headed to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. The Mount of Olives was one of the two places where there was kind of a bazaar that would have been set up, mostly for two things. It's not just for the temple, which we're going to read about in a minute, but it was to equip people who were traveling to the city so they could change their money uh, to temple currency. There was a, a place there around the Mount of Olives they could do that. They could also even buy animals for sacrifice if they were worried that they would not be able to purchase them uh, in the temple. And many people would do that try, or attempt to do that outside the city because, as you're going to find out, inside the temple they charged a lot higher rate. It's kind of like you, and you pay more for gasoline when you're on the throughway, right? As opposed to just at a regular gas station. And you pay more for food when you're at one of the travel stops as opposed to just where you would pay regularly. So that's kind of what happened, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But Jesus, knowing this prophecy and knowing that it would be fulfilled in this, he has his disciples untie this colt and bring it. Now, notice the people's response. There's, there's three responses I want to just briefly go over. Number one is that they throw their cloaks on this donkey, right? And, but they also, it says, spread their cloaks on the road. Now, this was the greeting that was reserved for royalty, for someone who was a king. And so by spreading the cloaks on the road, it was hailing Jesus as a king. And you see what they said. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna, he saves in the highest. And so there was this anticipation that Jesus was going to be this conquering king, almost reestablishing the Davidic kingdom once again in all of its glory. And so they were shouting that he is a king and proclaiming that by spreading their cloaks. But they were also shouting Hosanna, that God saves or save us. And they were crying out for liberation. They wanted Jesus to come and liberate them. And the expectation, much to the same as the disciples, which I referenced in my previous sermon in this series, was uh, for, for all the Jews that the Messiah would be someone who would deliver them from their oppressors, the enemies around them. The Messiah would come and free them from that yoke of oppression. And they were under the, the iron <laughs> fist of Rome. And they anticipated the Messiah was going to deliver them out from underneath that oppression. And so we see they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Also, another proclamation from the Old Testament about the messianic nature of Jesus. And so they're proclaiming him, him as a king. They're proclaiming that he can save. And they're proclaiming that he's a promised Messiah. Now, in juxtaposition to this loud uh, just raucous crowd that's making all this noise. You have Jesus who's riding in, uh, in the strangest of fashions, on this donkey, a, a, an ordinary beast of burden. And that just doesn't square. He's not in a chariot. He's not on a royal, you know, horse and with all this pomp and circumstances. No, he he comes in humble. And it's very interesting, Luke, in Luke's recording of this, he says that as Jesus drew near the city and he saw the city come into view, he, he stops and he actually weeps over the city. And he says, if only you had known on this day what would bring you peace. But it's hidden from your sight. Do, do we understand the mission of Jesus Jesus came in humbly as a servant, which I've spoken with you about previously in this message or in this series. But yet the, the crowd wanted to make him a king. 
He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom. They wanted him to, to deliver them from their oppressors. You see, one of the things that happens in this narrative, this account, really kind of plays out in front of us, this reality. Often, our mission it is not the same as Jesus. Our, our idea of what Jesus' mission is, um, is different than his. Our idea is, you know, Jesus is going to come and he's going to do these things for me. Well, Jesus' agenda may be very different than yours. His mission may be very different than the one that you have in mind, in much the same way as his mission differed so much from the crowd's expectations. I want to caution you not to come to Jesus with your agenda, but rather come to Jesus accepting his. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. You know, and during this whole time in our nation, there's a lot of people that are asking questions, including spiritual questions. And they're seeking Jesus. And the danger here is that many people will come seeking Jesus, just like the crowds that thronged around Jesus because they were excited. Oh man, if he raised Lazarus from the dead, maybe he can do this for me. Maybe he can feed me this. And Jesus at one point said to those who followed him, you're following me because you ate all these loaves. That was after he fed 5,000. And it's so easy for us to come to Jesus with my agenda instead of coming to Jesus in order to receive his agenda into my life. We come to Jesus and tell him how we want to be saved. Jesus comes and tells us how he's going to save us. Which way are you approaching Jesus? Are you approaching him in the sense of, here's what I want you to do for me? Or are you coming to Jesus humbly like he modeled and say, what can I do for you? And are you saying, Jesus, what, what do you want from me? I think a lot of times our own agenda blinds us to the very thing that God wants to give us. And that's exactly what Luke points out in his narrative there. And we see it illustrated in this moment in the triumphal entry. A great crowd, very enthusiastic, but you know what? A week later, many of that same crowd are going to be shouting, crucify him. Because Jesus didn't fit their agenda. And we need to be careful that when we come to Jesus, we're not coming with our agenda. But instead, we're saying, what is yours? And how can I be part of it? What is your mission, Jesus? And how can I be part of that? What do you want to do in my life? And how can I experience that? Well, there's two other things that happen, and I want to get to those. The next really significant moment that happens is just a few verses down, beginning in verse 15. And we see Jesus, the following day, is going to return to the temple. And there's going to be quite a moment of conflict that erupts here. And so I want to read this text for you. It's Mark chapter 11, and it's just verses 15 to 19. And it says, they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. Well, this is quite a moment, right? Jesus has just come in. The crowd's all thrilled. The next day, Jesus comes to the temple. Large crowd is there. Of course, we're gearing up toward Passover. You have all these people who are there. Now, remember I mentioned that you could buy... Uh, you know, animals for sacrifice, whether it's pigeons or you could buy grain offerings, all kinds of different goods and animals that you could buy for participation in the temple worship. 
And then uh, you could also change your money because there was a temple tax. In order to enter and participate in temple worship, you had to pay this tax. Uh, it went to support the work of the temple, but they only received it in their own currency. So they wouldn't accept Roman currency uh, because they said it was contaminated, defiled. And so they would only accept uh, the, the, the treasury of the temple, their own particular coin for this. And what happened was that people would take advantage specifically of people who were coming from outside of Jerusalem to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And they would take advantage of them. We know that uh, there would be increased prices for lodging. There were increased prices for goods. And people really kind of turning a, a buck on this thing, right? They were really enterprising into quite a commercial enterprise. And Jesus comes into this scene and he just totally upends the whole temple commerce that's going on. And he, in, including in that, he disrupts all the sacrifices that are going on. And the rulers see this and so they want to destroy him uh, because they're afraid of him because the people are, are paying attention to him, to Jesus instead of to them. In other words, their power is being taken away. Now I wanna talk a little bit of what some of is going on here. So we have the people on one side who are, are hanging on to Jesus' every words, I think is what Luke says in his account, uh, that they were hanging on every word that Jesus had to say. And, and so it's a really uh, a pivotal moment for them because Jesus comes in and he upsets everything that they were expecting to happen because he comes into the temple and he begins to do something that just seems so counterintuitive to them. I thought that Jesus was going to come in and, you know, help to bring about this righteous kingdom. And surely the temple has got to be an integral part of that. And here Jesus is driving out everyone, not just the people who were selling, but even the people who came there to buy. That means people from out of town that came there to buy. He drove them out as well. And he did not allow anyone to bring anything, it says, to carry anything through the temple. Now, when we talk about the temple, let me just quickly tell you that we're, there's this whole complex, which is part of the temple. It's called the Temple Mount. And so you've got these enormous, beautiful structures. And there was this large courtyard that went around. If you think of a big rectangle, there was a large, um, a large courtyard that went around that. And then uh, inside of that courtyard is where all these uh, people would be assembled and where all these goods and animals and money changers and stuff could be exchanged. Now, interestingly enough, the, the place where that happened was the only place within the Temple Mount proper that a Gentile, someone who wasn't a, a, a Jew or someone who wasn't uh, even a Jewish person who wasn't ceremonially clean. It's the only place that they could come and participate in any sort of temple experience. But yet during Passover, their spot was essentially eradicated because you have all of these things being bought and sold and everything else going on here. And so Jesus says, isn't my house supposed to be called a house of prayer for what? For all the nations. And so you have this group of people that are like, oh, Jesus is going to set up our Jewish kingdom. And he's like, wait a second, you guys are leaving some people out. And on the other hand, you've got the religious leaders who are like very upset because Jesus is upsetting their commercial enterprise that's happening and their religious practices, right? He's interfering in all of their stuff. And they are none too pleased about it and says that they were looking for a way to destroy him. And they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And so they were losing influence and power. They were losing their voice and they determined that they were going to stop Jesus. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see a real escalation in two things on their part. One, resistance to Jesus. They're going to begin to get into some open confrontations. We'll get to that in a minute. And then secondly, they're beginning to develop some real kind of tricky ways they could trap him and use his own words against him or even come up eventually with false witnesses so they could falsely accuse him and then be able to either, you know, lose all credibility for Jesus or better yet, put him to death altogether. And we know that's exactly ultimately what happens. 
uh, but the religious leaders are really upset. I just want to ask you a question in response to this. How do our practices align with Jesus' passion? Notice what Jesus' passion was. He wanted the temple to be a house of prayer and a place that welcomed people from all walks of life and everywhere. And he even put a stop to some of these practices that were happening. Something very interesting. When Paul, who was a Pharisee and then converted to faith in Jesus Christ, when he was writing to the church, he would write later that Jesus had torn down the wall of separation because here's a really interesting tidbit about the temple. You remember this courtyard that went around? Well, there was kind of this picket fence, if you can think of it, that was set up inside. So you've got the court root, courtyard here on the outside, and then there's this picket fence that kind of creates an inner courtyard. And that was what separated from where non-Jews could be and where Jews could be. And many people, when they hear of Paul writing that Jesus has torn down this wall of separation, they actually believe that Paul may be referencing this barrier that existed right within the temple complex, that Jesus kind of eradicated that. And so that we as Gentiles would have the same access to God as someone who had been a Jew. Let me ask you this question then. If those are Jesus' passions of unity, of availability of invitation to everyone and concern for all of these people, both the Jews and the Gentiles, the house of prayer for all nations. If Jesus' concern was zeal for righteousness and the things of God, how do our practices line up with that? Do our practices as a church as individuals who comprise the church? Do they reflect those passions of Jesus? Do we reflect the passion for prayer? Do we reflect the passion for righteousness? Do we reflect the passion for inviting people into this wonderful relationship with God? Or are we more concerned with our voice, our power, uh, our control, whether that's individually or as a church? Do we find it hard to celebrate when maybe another church does something good? God forbid. Do we, do we find it hard to celebrate when, when somebody else uh, maybe gets recognized for doing something good? Uh, and, and we're like, well, I didn't get recognized. Are we so in tune with ourselves, what we want, that we lose track of the things that God is passionate about? Can we celebrate the same things that God celebrates. Can we be passionate about the same things that God is passionate about? Because if we're not, can I just say that if Jesus showed up at the church, who and what would he be driving out today? And I think some of those things would surprise us. Because it's not all about our comforts. It's not all about our music. It's not all about, hey, I really like this or that or the other thing. It's about Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save, who wanted to invite people into a life-changing interaction with Almighty God. And the church is supposed to be the major gateway through which that happens. The church being both a building and the people in this case that we would be part of that same mission. We would have that same passion as Jesus. Maybe we have some house cleaning of our own to do. Well, lastly, as I mentioned, of course, Mark's going to go on in, in the end of this chapter. We're going to see the religious leaders begin their real stiff opposition to Jesus. And we see it beginning almost right away in verse 27 through 33, and we see the authority of Jesus is going to be questioned. Let me read it to you. And it says, they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, so they got everybody, came to him, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism 
of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Well, they discussed it among one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? For they were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Well, this is really interesting because you see, they're trying to come to Jesus and trip him up here. And they're trying to challenge his authority. They're like, hey, we're the religious authorities around here. Who gave you permission to come in here and upset our whole system? Who gave you permission to go and teach in the temple these kind of radical things that you've been saying of lately? Uh, who gave you permission to do this stuff? By what authority are you doing this? Well, Jesus understands what this is and he sees it's a trap. And so Jesus simply responds, hey guys, if you can answer one question, then I'll tell you. And he says, simply put, remember John the Baptist? Uh, by what authority did he do these things that he did? Now, it's very interesting because, again, Jesus is going to betray the motives of elders and scribes. They were worried about their kingdom. They were worried about their influence. They were worried about their uh, uh, opinion in, in, in the culture. They wanted people to think highly of them and they wanted to be respected and they wanted the, to be the authority. They wanted people to come to them and get the answers. But the problem is that John was not part of any of the priestly line. He's outside of that. And so is Jesus. And so he can't claim any heritage or right by some kind of priestly uh, you know, um, lineage or anything. He can't claim any of that for the reason of why he's doing this. John couldn't claim it, neither could Jesus. But they're like, we have, you know, we have this lineage. We can, we can say something about this. And so Jesus brings up John and, and he knows what's going to happen already because he knows that they rejected John as a prophet because John was saying that Jesus was the real deal. And they can't say John was the real deal because then they have to say Jesus is the real deal. And Jesus is who John said he was, the Messiah, the Son of God, right? And they know they can't do that. And so what do they do instead? They conclude, well, we can't, we can't say that it was from heaven because otherwise we'll be trapped into saying Jesus is legitimate, essentially. But we also don't want to say for man because the people all believe John was a prophet and then we're going to have all of our influence gone. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, we're just going to pick the safe answer. We don't know. We don't know. In other words, we're non-committal, but they understood that Jesus had exposed them for who they were. And, and Jesus betrays their motives. And here's the deal. He also traps them in their own attempt to trap him. Because if they don't know where John came from, then how can they know or judge where Jesus got his authority? The answer is they can't. And so Jesus exposes them. Now, why is this such an, an important moment? Because what it does is it really sets up this tension for power, control, and authority. Who's going to call the shots here? And from this moment on, you read through the rest of the chapters as we move into Holy Week, I'd encourage you to do that. What you're going to see is you're going to see a continual struggle. Jesus is going to call out and begin even to predict what's going to happen to him because of these people, chief priests, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, elders. But at the same time, the elders are going to ramp up their efforts to get Jesus out of the way because he's messing with their whole tradition. He's messing with their system and he's upsetting their influence. You know, I think a lot of conflict within us as believers comes out of the same root. And the question ultimately is this, who is the authority in my life? Here's what I know. A lot of people want to accept certain things of Jesus. They're like, oh, I'll take Jesus' love. But they don't want any of the truth that he has to say. They, they, they don't want to forgive their neighbor, right? They don't, they don't want to be honest. They don't, they don't want to stop doing this thing they know is wrong. A lot of people, and I think all of us at some point, we come to this struggle of who is ultimately going to be in charge, and that's exactly what happened here. Let me just say to you that if you want to participate in the mission of Jesus, 
if you want to display the same passion for the things that Jesus was passionate about, you've got to come to this position that you're not in charge here. That at the end of the day, it's not going to be you who's calling the shots and telling Jesus what he needs to do. At the end of the day, you're going to be the person who's going to say, the word of God is going to tell me what to do. Jesus Christ, the truth that is revealed to us is going to tell me what I should do. Not people's opinion, because that was what swayed the religious leaders. They didn't want to lose face with people. But at the end of the day, a follower of Christ has to come to this same position, this same struggle, and say, you know what? Christ is going to define what I say, what I believe, and what I do. Not fear of someone's opinion of me, not you know, fear of losing influence or my own power and authority. I'm in charge. Instead, it's going to be, you know what? He's in charge and I'm just going to, I'm going to walk in obedience and humility before him. And so how can you be the church in response to this? I think it's really simple. It's for you to adopt the same mindset that Jesus lived with, and that is of coming in humility and obedience. And if you walk in humility and obedience before the Lord, then you're going to have his kingdom come instead of yours. And you're going to have his will be done instead of yours. And ultimately, when it comes push to shove, you're going to say, God, you've got to have your way, not me here. And you're not going to let fear of others or fear of what someone will think or even your own personal, I want to do this instead, selfish, you know, motivated behavior on my own. You're not going to let those things drive you. It's going to be the truth of God's word that's going to drive you. And then, then you can truly experience the kingdom coming in your life just in the same way that Jesus expected you would and wants so badly for you to experience. So I pray this is helpful to you. And I pray at the end of this message, what you'll do is maybe just say, God, if there's some house cleaning that needs to be done, would you do that in my life right now? Uh, if there's some change in the motives and passions that maybe priorities that I've had, would you, would you help me to make those changes right now so that I might be the real true disciple, the follower of Christ that you've always intended for me to be. God may be so in our lives. Amen.